to those, that would be great. And you can have a seat once you get there. Throwing you a little curveball tonight. So, not singing right now. We'll wait till a little bit later to do that. So, hopefully you're able to be at the advance with us and be here last Sunday because tonight is just a continuation. Next week's going to be a continuation of that as well. And tonight, um, we're going to be talking about singing and why we sing in the church. So if you have your bulletin and just get that out, there's some notes that we'll be taking in there. But if you haven't been with us, just let me kind of catch you up to speed real quick. First of all, last Sunday, before we want to talk about singing, we wanted to talk about what worship truly is, just by itself, what worship of God looks like and what it looks like to be a worshiper of God. And then in the advance, we just kind of took a look at some things in our life that sometimes hinder us from being a worshiper of God. And so Ed spoke on um, Friday night and and really dug into Romans chapter 1, took a look at what it means when we truly trade the truth of God for a lie and the effect in our life on our worship through that. And then we did just a lot of time where we could just be really introspective and look and see and let God reveal a lot of things with us. Brandon helped us out with that. And then David, he really helped us to kind of see what it means to really be a fool for God. And, and, and Katie Bork came up and just giving a testimony and, and just hearing the scripture read about different places in scripture where people did things that looked kind of strange. It doesn't always have to be like the, the, the passage with King David running naked down the street. Like that's kind of an extreme example. It doesn't always have to be like that. Sometimes it's just the decision that you make looks really foolish to somebody because they don't understand the depth of, of your devotion to God. And you're going to run across that in your life many, many times. If you, if you hang around people that don't know Christ and you're trying to follow Christ, it's going to happen a lot. I've had it happen with my family in many, many different situations. Moving here was a big decision like that where our family, we're from, my, most of my family's from Oklahoma, most of Christina's family's from Arkansas. Moving to Ohio for a job that doesn't really pay anything just seemed really strange to them. You know, and some of them really thought it was an unwise decision, but God has really spoken to us as we moved here, and I believe He's spoken to them in their lives in that situation as well. And so as we get started tonight talking about singing, I want us to answer the question, why do we sing in the church? Why do we sing as Christians? Like, why is that such a big part of what we do? And I kind of want to take you on a little journey called music, like church music in my life, just so you can kind of get a vantage point of where I'm coming from. Maybe somewhere along the way you can kind of identify with some place I've been along my journey in church life. I grew up in the church and I grew up most of my younger years in a very traditional kind of church setting where our tradition was that you had a piano, an organ. Those were the two instruments that you were allowed to use. Drums were like, no, no, like those things are like of the devil. Sorry, Chris, but like you can't have those. My grandpa one time walked by a youth room and heard loud music coming out and he goes, Sounds like a bar in there, you know, like <laughs> what's going on there, you know, like let's stay out of that youth room. Something bad's going on in there. But it's pretty traditional. We had a music director, or a music minister who stood up and like waved his arm in the air. And for those of you music majors, you kind of know what all that means. But I was just kind of like, what in the world is he doing? Like no one in the congregation really knows what's going on with that, right? You know, I didn't. But that's kind of what normal was to me. And there really, honestly, at a young age, there was much dis- there was not much dissatisfaction with that. Because it's all I knew. It's all I knew was that. And I don't know that there was necessarily a whole lot of dissatisfaction that I needed to have with that. But the life-changing moment came when I was in middle school. I kind of alluded to this time period in my life last Sunday. But one of the the big changes was we went to youth camp. And this was before you had like worship bands and stuff everywhere. Like at least where I was from. And we went to youth camp and there was this guy named Billy Foote. You might know some of his songs. Sing to the King is a song that he's written. Um, you Are My King, Amazing Love, that song he's written. Started playing some of these songs. He had a six-string guitar and a 12-string guitar. So he was kind of like pretty crazy. And it was just him with his guitar. But it was really, as far as music goes in the church, was revolutionary to me. He had a bald head and a long goatee. Like that was kind of crazy. Most of the guys I saw, if they had a bald head, they were just an old guy. You know, he was a young guy. You know, and he was leading us in worship. And I started to learn what it meant to worship God kind of separate from music in this time period of my life. And, and there were times where I started to desire something a little bit different musically in my worship. And then I got into high school and my family moved to this little bitty country town. We had a, a guy that 
serve the Lord in, in that church in the musical capacity. It was kind of back to more, it was kind of more of a honky-tonk piano style, though. It, was, it wasn't like, like organ stuff. We just had like the honky-tonk piano, and he, he would get out his guitar sometimes. And uh, it was really interesting of that church because they were really open and receptive, just to a lot of new things, like new songs. And as I grew up, really we didn't do anything that wasn't in the hymn book. Like that was kind of like, if it's not in the hymn book, you can't do it because it's not like a sanctified, like, holy song if it's not in the hymn book, right? So we didn't sing anything outside of those. And then I got to college, and it really blew the doors off. There's no parents at college, right? You're just kind of left to yourself, right? My rebellion didn't take on the form of, like, drinking and smoking and stuff like that. My rebellion took on the form of, like, I started listening to passion music and Matt Redman music and delirious music. Like, I started getting into these things. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, that's not a piano playing anymore. That's like electric guitars. It's not like acoustic guitars. This is electric guitars. Blew my mind. And uh, did an internship while I was in college. One other part I didn't tell you about when I was younger is that we had special music. Like some of the music's not very special, but in other times there's special music that's a little bit more special than others. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that kind of equates to a solo. Like somebody comes up and sings a solo. We usually did it when we passed the offering buckets around. You know, there's nothing to do in those times anyway, so somebody came up and did a solo. I'm here to tell you, special music can change your life. Doing an internship at this church, it's actually the church that I grew up in. I'm sitting in the pew and um, looking out. Special music gets ready to start. We did it right, right before the message. We'd pass the offering buckets and somebody would come up and sing special music. And this young lady walked up there in a maroon pantsuit and saying, I can't live a day without you by Avalon. And it blew my doors off like it was Christina. And this was the first time she really caught my eye. And so during the special music, I wasn't really listening much to the lyrics of the song, honestly. Um, but uh, she caught my attention, really. So special music can change your life for one way or another. And... Uh, one of my other tasks that summer was to start a youth praise band. So we had, we had a the youth pastor, who's a friend of mine, played drums. I played guitar. I quickly recruited Christina because I knew she could sing. And I also thought she was pretty. So it worked out really well for me. And then we had some youth that came around that and played with us. And, and we, we, you know, I really, at all these times, like, I really didn't know what I was doing with a lot of this. And then we got in, we got, Christina and I got married into the early parts of our marriage up in Missouri where we're going to college, and, and I was kind of out of college at this time. We started going to this church, and uh, the music was really interesting at this church because they were trying to, have you ever heard of blended worship? Where you have like hymns and like praise songs or worship songs or whatever you want to call them, like blend them together. Well, this was kind of weird at this church. What they would do is before like we'd have like an offering time, we would have a time where we sang with the music minister, sometimes a choir and piano and organ. And then we'd take an offering, and then the guy would get up with a guitar and lead some other songs. I was like, that doesn't really blend things together very much. It kind of, it's almost like they're competing worship to me is what I felt like. We had this guy. He was actually an amazing musician who would sit at a keyboard because it wasn't just the guitar. We had like this whole for, full instrumentation, but there was just these two guys. Got a keyboard. He had like this foot thing that he played bass guitar sounds with his feet. Well, I played that. And then he would like trigger like this like really old, like probably from the 80s drum machine. So it's like... I mean, just really cool sounds, you know? So this is a weird time there with that in my life. And then the highlight of every year were when you got to have these things we called Fifth Sunday Sings. Every so often a month we'll have five Sundays. And when it does, it's on, let me tell you. Because it's like an open free-for-all sing for anybody that wants to come up and sing in the church. And I mean anybody can come up and sing in the church. Anybody can come up and sing. Nice part about it is you have a potluck afterwards. But one rule I found out pretty quick at that church is that you had, you had pews, so you didn't want to sit in the front section of chairs because you didn't have any place to duck your head and laugh during some of the songs. So you just didn't sit in the front row. You made sure you sat and you had some cover there to laugh during things. And one time this guy came through, comes up to our, our music minister and says, I'm a traveling professional uh, singer and evangelist. And we're like, okay, wow, this guy's pretty pretty happening, huh? And he had like this box of tracks that he sang with, like cassette tapes that had just the music but no vocals on them. And he pulled out one of them. And I could explain to you what happened, but I was watching 
just surfing the internet and came across this YouTube video earlier this week, and it reminded me so much of the event that you have. It, it, the only thing that was different is he got up on stage with a bottle of water before he sang, and I kid you not. And then started to sing. And this is kind of what it looked like right here. Well, this next and final song is going to be one that has made me pretty famous over the last few years. Um, it has took me a lot of places I didn't think I would be at. Um, but it was the first time on stage, New Year's Eve 2002, uh, with one of the best quartets out there today, Brian Free and Assurance. And I was pri uh, privileged to be able to sing this one with Brian Free. And uh, I don't know if I beat him that night or not, but ever since uh, then we've had competitions, I've wore him out. Um, not to make me look good or anything, but that's what happened. Of course not, not to make me but, look good. But uh, this is I one that also uh, my friends in our hometown church, Gospel Light Baptist Church in Salisbury, North Carolina, has uh, really made uh, their top choice. So therefore, we're going to finish off with this one. It's called Looking for a City. Looking for a city built above Looking for a city Where I'll never die And I, I think you kind of get the gist of what's happening here. Millions. So maybe you cut that off and save our ears from that. <laughs> Mike's going to make us suffer through this, I think. But it's kind of what it was like that day. And I'll never forget. I learned another lesson that day is not to sit by my good friend Robbie because we couldn't stop laughing. I mean, we're almost in the floors rolling at this guy singing. And uh, that was a, a monumental moment of singing in the church for me right there. And uh, shortly after that, we ended up moving up here to Columbus. And, and things really changed for us. I mean, we were, I mean, we were really responsible in taking um, just leadership in the role of music in a church. And, and just learning through that process was, was just, I don't know, it was really interesting for us. And I think... Kind of as I've gone through this journey, one thing I've noticed is that I've never really heard a lot of teaching from Scripture on why we sing in the church. And it, when I did, it seemed to always take a turn to worship, which isn't a bad thing, and that's why we talked about it last week. But I think it's important to know why we sing. Why do we sing in church? And I, as I've been studying Scripture over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of things that have been highlighted to me on why we sing and why it is so important for us as the church and if we don't have our purpose centered on Christ and, and what, what it really means to worship through song, we can get off base with what it means. And there are good things. Like these are things I heard when I was growing up that we sing because it prepares us to hear the message or it prepares us to hear the word of God. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, I think it can do that. But if it becomes our focal purpose, the problem becomes, in, I mean, logically in my mind, I'm like, why would we sing? Like, can't we sing some songs on the car on the way here? And then we just have more of the good stuff, right, once we get there. I mean, it seems logical to me that that would be a place you go. Um, I've heard it that say that, you know, we sing because just some people connect that way, which automatically means that some people aren't made to connect that way, and it's not important for them to sing, which I think is really not very true if we look at the Scriptures tonight and see what it has for us. Sometimes we sing because we want to praise people. Like I knew when we did special music sometimes, they were like the knockout. Like if we had like a special guest come in, there were certain special music singers that we would have sing. One would be like Christina, you know, and some other people. Like the really good singers, you wouldn't ask this guy to come up during those Sundays because you run the, the special guest off. Um, sometimes I think we, we think we sing, or maybe not, we wouldn't never say this, but as musicians, like we want to we sing because we want to play our instrument or we want to we sing out for people. Some people will say we sing because we want to, we want to sing certain songs or a certain style. And then even I think some people say we sing because it's a, an attractional thing for people that don't know Christ. And I think all those things, a lot of them are, are very off-base things. Some of them have some good purpose to them but aren't the main purpose of why we sing. And so I want us to take a look at Colossians chapter 3. And Brandon kind of started off in Colossians chapter 3 yesterday morning for us. And if you kind of read through that, the first part of it really digs into talking about sin and some things that we need to make 
not a part of our life. Get this sin away from our life and out of our life. And then in, in verse 12 of chapter 3, there's a little turn where it starts to talk about what our lives become like when Christ is in them. So it becomes this very positive thing that happens when you start to look at the second half of this chapter. And I guess in that light, I want this to be a very encouraging message that you hear tonight. Like I don't, I hope you don't walk away from this and hear me saying that you should, you need to sing or you need to sing more or anything like that. I want us to see the purpose of why we sing, sing and look at why it's so important and then make the inference in our own life what God is calling us to do with that. So let's take a look here. We're going to read just one verse, Colossians 3, verse 16. Very simple verse. It says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with all thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so a very, very simple verse that basically tells us to sing. I don't know that there's really much beyond that. It does, it very explicitly tells us that we are supposed to sing. But there's some keys in there to behind why we're supposed to sing that I think are very, very important to us. Um, the one thing I want to point out that, that there's three different things there. It talks about hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. And if you kind of look at the, the Greek words in the original language in which they're written, they all mean virtually the same thing. They kind of all mean the same type of thing, a song to God or a spiritual-based song or a, a song of thankfulness to God or a song telling of the greatness of God, just different things like that. And what we can draw from that is probably more of a contextual thing when it brings up those three different things. I mean, we could do that real easily. We could say that it's songs based out of the book of Psalms, the hymns out of some hymnal that you might have, and worship songs that you've heard recently on a CD. It's a, con it's a context thing there. Or you could, you could classify it in songs that are really old, songs that are kind of old, and songs that are really new. You know, so those, those three words of those different types of things aren't really all that important in the emphasis of why we sing. They're just the type of songs we sing, the songs that we sing to God. And, and we're blessed to have just a vast array of songs that have incredible meaning about our God that we can sing from way back in, in the Bible to ones that you might find in an old hymnal to ones that you'll find on the CD that's coming out next month or something. So we're really blessed in that manner. But in your bulletin, we've got three purposes I want us to kind of key on in this passage of Scripture. The first one is the upward purpose. Again, kind of like last week, the first point, most important, the upward purpose of why we sing. And when we start off this verse on singing to God, we've, we, it's very easy to look at that and see that it's about us singing to God. It starts off with an up, upward purpose as it draws our attention to the word of Christ or the message of Christ in other translations. You see that right off the front, front part of that verse is that it draws our attention to the message of Christ and draws our attention upward to God through Jesus. And I think we need to start here because it is a big deal to God that we sing. And if we have any purpose in our singing, it needs to be this, the upward purpose it is actually a very, very big deal to God. You know, I think we sometimes think more about our preference when we talk about music in the church, but it's a big deal about God, a big deal to God. And if you look through the scriptures, you can see all kinds of evidence of this, all kinds of evidence of this. You might even say, some people, as I was studying, would say that singing is actually one of the most commanded things in all of scripture. Singing is actually mentioned over 130 times in most translations. In the Bible, it's a huge part of Scripture. But the first thing about the upward purpose I want us to know is that God desires our song. God desires our song. And I loved what Ed said, that, that God is not like a, a little wimpy guy who's begging us to do something, but he does desire it. He longs for us to sing to him. And not in some kind of weird way where he's just like, needs it to lift him up but he desires it because he knows it's good for us. And we'll talk about those and some of the other purposes. But God desires us to sing to him. We can see this just by the sheer number of times it mentions it in Scripture. I actually printed out a little list here of all the times. There's 14 pages in this specific translation, 132 times it mentions singing to God directly. Let me just read you a few of these. 
as, as we kind of think about this point here. It says, Then Moses, and this is the first recorded time in Scripture of singing happening. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. And as Moses and the, the people of Israel were being delivered from Egypt, this happens and they stop and they sing a song of praise to God. Another out of the book of Judges, I love this one. It says, listen, you kings, pay attention, you mighty rulers, for I will sing to the Lord, I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. And in the face of earthly kings, singing and praising and lifting up the king of kings. This is a beautiful thing. In First Chronicles, it says, uh, this is David here, David also ordered the Levite leaders to appoint a choir of Levites who were singers and musicians to sing joyful songs to the accompaniment of harps, lyres, and cymbals. And it was so important to God that he actually set aside a whole group of people to actually conduct the music in the temple. Just a, a huge important thing. Later on in the next chapter it says, Let the whole earth sing to the Lord each day proclaiming the good news that he saves. The message of Christ there again, that he saves. The upward purpose of worship. God desires it from our life immensely. And we see it all throughout this. And if you think about the book of Psalms alone, I haven't even gotten to that point in those, the, I'm kind of way off, I haven't even gotten there yet in those, that list of verses about singing. But the book of Psalms alone, if you think about it, we have preserved for us like this ancient hymnal of our faith. It's a very, very, very beautiful thing that we have. And it's actually, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but it's the longest book in the Bible by far on any account that you try to, to judge it by. If you judge it on chapter, it has 150 chapters. The second place book of the Bible that has chapters is Isaiah. It has 66. 150 in this ancient praise book of, of God to 66 in another book. If you're like, well, chapters really don't, they didn't have chapters back when they wrote it, so it doesn't mean a whole lot. Go to verses. Psalms has 2,461 verses. Genesis is the next closest with 1,533 verses. So a vast number more there, almost 900 more. And be like, okay, well, that's still they didn't have verses. Just sheer words alone. Psalms has 43,743 words. And the next closest is over 1,000 away is the book of Jeremiah with, with 42,659 words. And what that says to us is that God cares immensely about our praise to him. He desires it. He gave us a, a book to look at. And, and Psalms is the most... The, the, it's the, the piece of literature or poetry that's been put to music the most in the history of the world. And this is a, a beautiful treasure for us to have in Scripture. And this treasure is a gift from God. And I want you to imagine that you gave a gift to someone that you loved and it was meant for like intimacy between the two of you. And then all the time that's used for intimacy with other people. We have this beautiful gift of music that is... It's, its primary purpose is for us to connect with God. Yes, it's a gift that we can use in a lot of different ways, but its primary focus is for us to connect with God. And God so desires that. And I wonder sometimes if we use that gift for other things more often than we do for the praise of God. But God desires our song. Secondly, though, He also deserves our song. He deserves our song. You don't have to look any further than, than what it says at the very par first part of this verse. It says the message of Christ. If you just, on the message of Christ alone, God deserves all our praise for the work of Christ on the cross should mean everything to us. And I'm not going to take a bunch of time to look through this tonight. I'm just going to read one verse to kind of make a point here in the book of Psalms because we could run all over the place with this. I mean, we could go in and out of Scripture all night long and talk about why God deserves our song and why God deserves our praise. But just one simple verse from the book of Psalms is in, in chapter 40. And I'm just going to read verse 5. It says, O Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal if I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I could never come to the end of them. And so if you just think about the message of Christ alone, that's enough for him to deserve our praise. 
But if we truly think about our lives and we take a look at Scripture, we're going to be faced with the reality that we could recite things that we need to praise God about for the rest of our lives. And He deserves our praise above all else. And when I think of that, I think of just all the songs I hear on a daily basis on the radio and from other places that praise really silly things. There's a lot of silly just songs that are really praise songs. If you read the lyrics, they're praising someone or they're praising something. And it's such a lesser thing than God. And I'm so thankful, especially this weekend as we're at the advance, just for all the people that we have a part of this church that can, can lead out and worship musically and can lead out and worship through teaching of the word. And I just want to thank, and we had so many different people through breakout sessions, through the little sacrifice of praise times that we had late at night, early in the morning, in the free time. And even just like spontaneous little moments of worship that I saw pop up here and there. And I just want to thank you guys just for using your gifts that God has given you to praise His name. It's just a beautiful thing. And as I heard just kind of one of the spontaneous moments going on, I was just struck by the song that was being sung. And I was, Shantae, thank you very much. Like fr- the, the, the Saturday afternoon, just the praise time there that we had was just, I mean, it was really incredible. I know she was really nervous, but just using that gift that she has for the Lord. But then I heard these lyrics being sung by her a little bit later in the afternoon. And I want you to see if you can pick up on these. You know you love me. I know you care. You just shout whenever and I'll be there. You are my love. You are my heart. And we will never, ever, ever be apart. Are we an item, girl? Quit playing. (laughs) We're just friends. What are you saying? Said there's another and looked right in my eyes. My first love broke my heart for the first time. And I was like, baby, 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 oh. Like, baby, 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 oh. Like, baby, 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 oh. I thought you'd always be mine. And then repeats that same thing again. Baby, 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 oh. Like, baby, 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 oh. I mean, there's really funny things in here. When I was 13, I had my first love. I mean, I skip a beat when I see her in the street. I mean, it's good rhyming there, I guess. But, And you see what I mean? Like, this is a, this is a praise song right here. And I'm picking on Shantae, but, and she knows that. But we see songs like this all the time, and we sing songs like this. And, but sometimes it's hard for us to praise God, and I wonder if we understand how much He truly deserves it in our life. And I mean, I, this seems silly, but I see people worship Justin Bieber. I work at a school system working on the computers, but our office is in a middle school. And sometimes we have to venture outside of our office down to like the restrooms or the, the main office there to pick up packages and stuff. And, you know, girls, it's pretty easy to see girls, little girls like that, worshiping Justin Bieber, right? You might think the guys don't at all, but they do too. You just look at their haircuts. They all worship him. They all have that haircut that he does, you know? You know, or they've got their hoodies on with their hood up like this, you know? And I mean, you can see they worship him in one way or another. And it seems so silly because... I mean, he might be a great guy. I don't know him. But does he deserve worship like God deserves worship? No, not at all. And I want you to think about those lyrics I just read. And I'm going to go back to Psalm 40 and read just five verses of this. And you tell me the difference here of which one deserves to be praised. This girl he's talking about, this baby or whatever. Or this, Psalm 40. I'm just going to start with verse 1. Read down to where we were a second ago. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in him. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord! who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. O God, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans are far too numerous numerous for us to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I could never come to the end of them. And that's one small portion of 150 of these that we have in Scripture recorded for us. And we could do that to the end of time and never come to the end of why 
God deserves our praise. It's an incredible thing that we have. This upward purpose that we are to focus on God and give Him our praise with our lips in song because He desires it and He deserves it. But we see a second purpose back in Colossians. Right after that it says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. This speaks of where the song comes from. And what I want us to see here in point number two is the inward purpose. The inward purpose of our song. Because we are able to let this message of Christ, these deeds that He's done, dwell within us. And this is why I think it's different than just a command in Scripture. Like I said, some people look at singing as one of the most commanded things in Scripture. It's because if you look and you study it, you see that the people that sing, it's like coming up within them and they can't keep it down. They can't keep it within themselves. And if you look again at all these verses that I pulled out a second ago, I'm going to read some more of these. And especially if we, we get into the book of Psalms, you see things like this. I will, I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Being filled with joy. I will sing, another one here, I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Being filled with his goodness and bursting at the seams to sing. He has given me a new song to sing to him. He has given me the song. I didn't hear it on the radio. I didn't buy a new CD. I didn't pick up a song book. He has given me the song. He's put it inside me. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And it goes on and on and on and on, verse after verse after verse of Scripture. This song is inside of us. The inward part of worship is that God has, when we see Him and we we see that He deserves our praise, this song boils up inside of us and we can't keep it in anymore. One aspect of this that you see in verses 15, 16, and 17 in Colossians is just a simple, simple thought of another thing of praise to him. Yes, we have the message of Christ, but it brings up another thing. I'm going to read here in verse 15, back in Colossians 3. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ, in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness, in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And this idea that thankfulness is kind of the wellspring of the song within us. When you see and you see that He deserves it, this thankfulness is the inward worship coming out in us through song. And I want to ask you just a simple question. What song is inside you? Is it one of thankfulness? Is it one like the ones I've read from the Psalms? Or is it like some of the ones I see all the time around me? I see lived out songs of anger towards God. I see lived out songs of apathy towards God. I see lived out songs of doubt to God. And then I see lived out songs of praise to God. And I also see all of these things uttered with words. Sometimes in song, you can listen to the radio and you can hear people angry at God. You can hear people apathetic towards God. You can hear people doubt God and they're singing praise in that way. When God deserves the praise from us from a thankful heart. And so what is the song inside you? The inward purpose of our singing is that he has put a song inside of us. And I really appreciate it. One thing that Brandon said the other day, yesterday morning, he said, sometimes we want to worship God on our own terms. And sometimes we want to stop here at the inward purpose of worship. We want to say, worship's just between, you know, my singing and worship is just between me and God. You know, let's, go, let's just stop here. And it's just between me and God. I'll get my own little place. But you can see real quickly how that becomes all about me. And it becomes very me focused like Ed was talking about. And if you keep reading in here, there's an amazing part. And I think it's actually, you know, beyond the upward part is maybe one of the the bigger focuses in this verse. If you look at the end, it it says, this message of Christ, we're going to let it dwell within us with all wisdom, 
We are to teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're to teach and admonish one another with these songs. Teaching, I think, is a pretty easy thing to understand. But admonish means that we're supposed to correct. We're supposed to lift up. We're supposed to, you know, on behalf of other people, sing these songs. And this third point is the upward purpose. Or excuse me, the outward purpose. We already did upward. The outward purpose. There's this outward purpose that I think a lot of times we miss out on. I don't know. Hopefully you know how rare it is for people to come into a room together and actually sing songs together. It's kind of weird. The only other time in my life I've really seen it happen much is like right after 9-11. People got together a lot and would sing like really patriotic songs. You know, and sometimes, you know, at concerts people are singing along. But their, I mean, I think their focal point is to hear this band play songs. But it's kind of weird for people to come together and sing songs to you know, a person that's not really in the room. It just seems kind of strange. It's a really rare thing. But it's a really beautiful thing if you think about all the stuff that we've been talking about here. And I think sometimes we're too inwardly focused to think about the people around us. And I think the best way that for me in my life I can describe this purpose of worship to you is that, you know, many times people, like if, if a new person that comes in on our worship team or is, you know, going to lead worship for us, they might ask me the question, why do you pick your songs? That's like the most common question people ask. And it's a good question. And as I've kind of gone through this journey that I was talking about at the beginning, one of the things that God's really led me to do is, yeah, I'll listen, to, I'll know what the message is about. You know, I'll kind of know the direction that we're heading, those kind of things. But probably the main thing I use is I try in just the week in, week out, daily part of my conversations with you guys, I try to listen to what God's doing in people. And then I pray and I ask God, what do they need to sing? What do the people of New Life need to sing to you? How do they need to connect with you? And there are Sundays when I get up here and we sing a song that I may not like, might not care for at all, but I know somebody said something that has made me think of it and we're singing it. And there's this, there's this time, and we see this here in Scripture, that we need to sing on their behalf. And we need to reach out with our heart to them and sing and lift up. There have been times when I know people are in an incredible, incredible pain in life. You know, we'll sing a song like, You Never Let Go. And it might be a great time in my life. But I can connect with that song because the people around me, I know that some of them are suffering. And I'm praying and I'm singing that song on their behalf. And that is the heart of the outward purpose of worship that we come together and we lift these songs up, not just as individuals, but together as one. And singing just has a huge, huge role in our lives. If you think about it, God created music. He created us. And I think He created those things to go together. You know, if you start to study some other religions, you'll see that music isn't really as big a part of them as they are for us. And especially in our country, like we spawned a whole like business industry based on like church type music. It's kind of weird. You don't see like other religions that have their own like big like businesses like that in the U.S. And some other religions actually, they try to demean music and say it's actually evil and it's wrong which is an interesting part because I think the enemy knows that God has designed it for us to connect with him. And so any way that he can kind of distract us from it, whether saying that it's wrong or saying that you should sing it to this being or to this person or to this thing, to get us off track is the main course there. And music has an incredible thing for us that it helps us connect emotionally. It doesn't, you know, we could just recite things, right? We could just get together and just like say them. It might sound, that would be really weird for us now, right? just to say, like chant or something. But music connects with us on an emotional level, and it's because God created it that way. He created it for us, because sometimes you know you try to say things, and you can't, you can't quite get there with just words, and your spirit has to be able to communicate that. And there's a verse in Scripture in 1 Corinthians that actually talks about that, that prayer and singing actually help us connect the spiritual part of our life with the actual verbal words that we say. And so as we've kind of talked about these three purposes, we have the upward purpose of our singing, we have the inward purpose of our singing, 
And we have the outward purpose of our singing. Very, all three of them, very important to have them connected together in our lives. But I think the focal point, that we have to, we have to understand and we have to see that God deserves it. And that's where the inward springs up within us. And again, I hope you don't hear me saying tonight that you need to sing more. You better sing every single song that we ever sing, every single word. It's not what I'm saying at all. But I think we do need to check our hearts to see how much we value God, how much we've seen God, and how much He deserves it in our life. And see if that song is in you. And just kind of one last question as we wrap up. It's interesting, like, I don't think you really go to movies at all anymore. I've seen one movie that didn't have any music in it. I can't remember what the word of it was. It had George Clooney in it. It was black and white. It was about a radio show. It had, like, a lady on the radio show singing, but it had no, like, background music, and it was really, really strange. Has anybody ever seen a a movie with no music in it? Is it kind of weird to you? It's kind of weird, you know? It draws your attention to, to some other things. But if you think about our lives, they're just completely filled with music. You know, every wedding you go to, there's music, right? When a bride walks down the aisle, there's music. You know, everywhere you go, like in restaurants, there's music playing overhead. And the question I have for you is what or where does your song come from? The song from inside you, where does it come from? Because you can come in here and sing every song we ever sing. And it not come from that inward purpose of worship in your life. So where does your song come from? And I just want you to think about those things. I wanted to give us some time to respond. So we're going we're gonna to worship together some more through song. But just really think about those things. As we sing these songs, don't just think, because I, you know, I think people say, you know, let's think about the words you should say and make sure you're not just singing them. That's good. But even go beyond that and think about how God has impacted your life through the actual words that you're singing. Don't just think about them, but think deeper into your life how God has impacted you through the truths that we sing. So I'm going to pray for us, but if you guys would go ahead and stand, we're going to continue to use this beautiful gift that God has given us of music. We're going to praise Him because He deserves it in our life, and He desires it out of our lives. So God, I just want to thank you for this gift of music that you have given us. And just want to ask you that you would continue to move in all of our lives so that we can see you. We can sit here and sing songs, but it doesn't mean anything without you moving in our hearts. And so even now as we sing these songs, I pray that you'd be able to show us and reveal to us just how much you truly deserve our praise. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.